go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss graph databases, practical use cases, sponsored today by Cambridge Semantics. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen to activate that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Thomas from Cambridge Semantics for a word from our sponsor. Thomas, hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. My name is Thomas Cook, and I lead sales and pre-sales here at Cambridge Semantics for Anzograph DB. And I wanted to share with you some information about a couple of the products that we have and also a use case around modern data integration and analytics using graphs. One of the uh, recent wins that we're very proud of is with the Food and Drug Administration that we, uh, that we recently announced. And they came to us and said it's very difficult for us to answer questions quickly because our data is in many different applications and databases. We have siloed data. And this is a common problem across every organization that we hear. And it's not the availability of the data, but it's the ability to ingest, integrate, and interpret the data that is the challenge. And that's where scalable enterprise knowledge graphs come to the rescue. And our ANZO knowledge graph platform can help to solve this problem by automatically linking together all of these different sources, you're able to answer questions across these different siloed data sources. And so here we are creating the single view of the drug product. You can see many different applications that have full databases behind them. Any kind of question, a lot of questions that need to be answered, the data is in each one of these different applications. And it's very difficult to combine those and link it together in the right way to be able to accurately and effectively answer the question. And so here's an example using two of these different databases, the approved drug products, and the FDA adverse event reporting system, a uh, simple example of how to link those, we automatically can create the ontology from those data sources. An ontology is, a, is basically the schema of the graph. You can think of it if you're not familiar with the word ontology. And then we can link those together. So you can see product information from the orange book and the uh, fares data with patient and adverse effect, effects uh, linked together with a new memory automatically combining them. And here is a, another view of that. If we take a look at the orange book, it has some information about uh, the different products. You can see the product, the application, the approval date, uh, who the applicant was for that product. And then in the uh, blue section, you can see product information, the drugs, the active ingredients, the strengths, et cetera. And then on the, uh, the last one here is a daily med. This is an unstructured data source, and so we can use NLT to extract the entities and relationships in that. And then the ANZO knowledge graph platform will link together all of that information, giving you the ability to link that uh, together. Uh, and so it is a scalable knowledge graph platform for modern data innovation and analytics. There is a MPT OLAP engine behind it called Anzograph DB. It can scale to hundreds of nodes and trillions of facts. We offer enterprise grade uh, cloud deployment with Kubernetes and, and security. There's also a catalog and UI to blend, model, and access the data. This is a quick run, run through of the different steps required to create a knowledge graph. So, first, we onboard the data by ingesting and mapping those sources. We can connect to over 200 different sources, and you can also virtualize the data or you can bring it into our in memory graph uh, in, into a cluster. You can then create different data models for different questions that you want to answer, and then blend those together in what we call graph marks. And then at the end, you can access those with uh, third party. Uh, analytics tools, and we can also do analytics inside the Anzo uh, data platform. And you can also connect it with JDBC and OData uh, to other BI reporting tools and other analytical tools. And last, 
The ANZO data platform is built on top of ANZO Graph DB. It is a standalone graph database. You can download a free, uh, there's a free edition and there's also an enterprise edition. And you can download that and try it today. This has more of a, a programmatic interface. This is a UI that the ANZO knowledge graph platform has, but very strong uh, scalability and performance capabilities. You can see some of our analytical benchmarks at the bottom uh, to other leading vendors in the space. Uh, we can connect over 200 different data sources directly. Uh, also offering a virtualization. We have the fastest data loading with up to 250 gigabytes per hour per load. Uh, it can scale horizontally to be tested it up to over 200 nodes. Um, and there's very rich analytic capability. We're built entirely upon standards. So it is an RDS triple store, but we also support the Cypher query language. And we also support RDS star, which uh, allows you to be labeled property graphs in your database. And so uh, please download it today and try it out um, or reach out to us. We have several webinars on both products, both the ANZO Knowledge Graph Platform or ANZO Graph DB, the standalone graph database. And I want to thank you for joining today's webinar. Thomas, thank you so much for this great presentation. And if you have questions for Thomas or about Cambridge Semantics, you may submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen in the Q&A portion, and he will be joining Donna in the Q&A at the end of the presentation today. Now let me introduce the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert on information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Donna, hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you, Tom, for that great introduction, um, very helpful. And as Shannon uh, mentioned, this is the Data Arch Strategy, Architecture Strategy Series, and, and it's great to see a lot of familiar names on the attendee list, so thanks for many of you who attend these each month. Uh, for those of you who this may be your first webinar in the series and are particularly interested in graph, um, and this is often one of the most common questions is, will this be recorded? And yes, all, all this, the webinar will be recorded and available on Dataversity for, I think, perpetuity, as if uh, any of the other topics that were done this year in 2020 are available on demand. Uh, so please uh, take advantage of that. This is another free resource uh, offered by Dataversity. Um, so the, the sad part is this is the last one this year, uh, although it's 2020, so for many of you, maybe it's good riddance, right? It's been a strange year for all of us. Um, but the good news is we will be doing another lineup next year in 2021. Um, so again, those of you who have been joining regularly, I hope you can continue to join um, some other hopefully interesting topics. I'm particularly um, excited about the one in March because we actually have a um, case study from um, so a data, data modeling is always very popular on data diversity and uh, case studies are often, often very popular. So no, this is a large um, building and manufacturing company that uh, is showing how they use enterprise data models. So that one might be of particular interest, but I hope you can join as many as you are able to. So, um, but today's topic is on graph and, and Tom gave a great uh, introduction, but just to kind of cover what we are going to talk about is this idea of graph databases. And there has been an amazing spike in popularity in recent years. Now, for many of the reasons that Tom mentioned, um, just a different way of looking at some of these mass data sets, especially, you know, cross-platform, cross-industry, um, for areas, you know, in a lot of a lot of different industries, um, Tom mentioned kind of, you know, healthcare, pharma, um, fraud detection for financial services, marketing, network optimization, and op IT, right? There's a lot of different uh, use cases, and we'll talk about a few today. Um, but for those techie folks in the call, and we always get techie folks, which is great, as an architecture um, webinar, um, it's been said that you know sort of the data model is the metadata, and the metadata is the database, and that might be um, 
you know, sort of uh, seems complex, but hopefully by the end of this, you'll see the value of that and what that, what that actually means more likely in a practical application. And that'll be the focus of this. It's a very high level. Um, you know, we're not going to get into how you, how you write how OWL or, or any of the detailed semantics. There's plenty of resources on that. So hopefully what these webinars can offer you um, is one of the most exciting things, but also one of the most challenging things of being a data architect or a data management professional is just trying to keep your head around all of the different opportunities that are available um, because it isn't, a, you know, it's not 1990 whether it's relational or, or not, right, or COBOL. Um, there's a lot of different uh, tools and, and to kind of at least keep in your head which tools are right for which job is something we're trying to do in this webinar series. So if you go away with nothing else to really understand where graph might fit in your organization or, or your architecture, then we've, we've done something good today. Um, so what is a graph database? So uh, the idea of a graph database is this idea of kind of using nodes and ed edges to store relationships. And as I mentioned with that quote, it's, it's really the, almost the relationships between the data points are as important, if not more, than the individual points themselves. And that really helps you discover new insights. So, you know, we have relationships in a relational database, you know, customer buys product, um, but often, and we'll talk more about this, in a relational database, we're thinking more about the nouns. What are all the attributes on a on a, a customer, and and it is very prescriptive, and that is good. It, 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 these these technologies can live together. Um, you definitely need to do that hard work with data quality, et cetera, to make graphs sing. And if you don't, you know, if, if every customer in your database is named John Smith, the, the power of a graph isn't going to be <laughs> very valuable, right? So, and, and the examples um, Tom showed that you know the, those data sources were very well structured and and were you know. They were published. Um, so you, you do need good data to start with this or your results, as with anything, garbage in, garbage out. Um, but this is a new powerful data platform to be able to look at data. So let's just go more into, I like to in my head, again, there's so many different technologies to kind of have some sort of mnemonic about each one. So when I think of graph, I sort of think thing relates to thing. Um, if those nodes and edges, if anyone's familiar with Dr. Seuss, so the thing one and thing two, um, that's how I think about it. It's just how do we get those things related to each other um, and, and kind of see those patterns. The formal way to say thing relates to thing, um, the idea of nodes and edges or vertices, really every tool or every um, modeling technique use slightly different words, but just the idea of, again, you should be familiar with this if you're familiar with databases, you've got the thing um, and you've got the relationship. But one of the differences in graph, and we'll talk a lot about that in this presentation, is that those relationships are really for first order um, relationships and, and the way you can sort of look at data with different lenses. Um, um, as, as Tom mentioned, you have kind of different ontologies, right? Because there's data and then you have different, um, different uh, views on that data or different ways you want to look at it. So at the very core, um, is this idea of the, the things and the relationships between the things or the nodes or the edges. One of the nice things about graph in, in my mind, um, it is a different way of looking at data. I mean, one of the, again, good things of relational, you're very structured, is you, you have a customer has these attributes, you, you have the constraints of, of how it can link to other things. Um, but the human brain sort of works in a graphish way, right? You say something like, oh, I should go visit Mary. Huh. Mary's brother, John, I wonder how she's doing. Is she still dating Stephanie? Remember he had that boat? Oh, boats on the lake were great. They still have that house in the lake, and uh, they had a boat, and oh, it looks like that boat I had as a kid, right? Your brain, th these are structured connections. I mean, it's not completely random. Each one of these has sort of a node that really see other, right? They have Mary has a brother who is John who has a uh, girlfriend or partner who is Stephanie, or you know, J John had an activity or is linked to his boat, right? So th there's structure around that, but it is, it's not as formal as if you're building a data warehouse and you've predefined what, what you're going to think about when you go to visit Mary. Mary will buy product, right? That's, that's sort of the relational mindset. Um, and so y yes, this can be a little more loose, but there is some structure around it. Uh, that said, um, if your mind works like mine, you probably have something to the squirrel, right? There's <laughs> probably some random data points. My brain doesn't go in a straight line, and you probably noticed that on these webinars. Um, so that just sort of underscores the idea of that data quality is important no matter what data platform you're using, right? Again, if, if all of your customers are named John Smith, you're not going to get great insights if the data itself, underlying data, 
doesn't have value or isn't structured well or doesn't have good quality. Uh, so that should go without saying on the data diversity webinar, um, but it is important to remember. And, and I've had people sort of argue with me on that. You know, now that we have big data, data quality doesn't matter. Well, if the data is garbage, you're not going to get good insight. That, that should just be a core foundation. So, but this is a new way of looking at things. And, and to go back to that again, Kind of the traditional way of looking at the world doesn't mean it is a bad way. We still use this all the time. Super helpful. But if you go way back, if you remember in school, whatever grades you learned this one in, as that idea of um, Linnaeus in 1735 had a hierarchy, a taxonomy for organizing biological systems. And I remember memorizing, I think for me it was third grade, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? Is a wolf and lupus or whatever I should should have looked that up before I said something, right? But that we still use that all the time. There's the periodic table of elements, right? We, so in many of my customers have very defined taxonomies and hierarchies for their da that data. That is very helpful. We've made many, many scientific discoveries based on that and having some organizational structure to keep track of, you know, plant systems and animal systems and biological discoveries. Um, and I'm sure the examples that Tom gave in terms of, you know, FDA, they use Hierarchies and taxonomies too, right? Doesn't mean this goes away. That's just not the only tool in the toolbox, right? And I think, you know, not to get too philosophical, but I do. Um, I think back in the day in 1735, Linnaeus and probably a lot of folks said, well, gosh, we are onto something. If we can just put everything in the world in our little bucket and we can name it, we'll have everything in the world figured out. And that's sort of quaint. Um, and, and that would be lovely if our brains were big enough or, or the world were simple enough that everything can fit in a taxonomy and it just doesn't. And, and what I find interesting, if you look sort of at a new world, a little more looking at this, is this idea of emergence or chaos theory um, in science, right? Where there are concept complex systems and patterns and, and it's probably physics and math that's beyond my small brain, um, that, that you do get these patterns and systems out of the multiplicity of rel relative simple interactions, like a thing relates to thing. So think of a snowflake. Um, without getting too religious or philosophical, there's no person that, invent, that designed every single snowflake, right? There is sort of a random pattern where water comes out of the sky and forms into these crystalline structures. Um, but it's a no two snowflakes look alike, but there is a snowflakeness. And you will see that there's patterns that have a lot of similarities. And when you go down to the core of those patterns, there is a structure. Um, so that's sort of a scientific application of that. But that's used in practical things as well as city planning. Um, I, if you, you know, go to sort of a modern, say, American city that was sort of planned on a, on a prairie, it's all very straight, you know, grid lines, right? If you go to Rome or in Boston, right, the, it was sort of built from cow paths and, and things just sort of ran. If you know where you're going, um, it's great. If you don't, uh, good luck to you. Um, but I think modern city designers realize that ne neither one of those is, is perfect and those straight lines aren't always as, fish, as efficient. I know in my university, they had this straight line of the lot, they sort of built it in those straight grid patterns, but everybody cut across the lawn because that was the fastest way to get there. Uh, so eventually they paved that path across the lawn and, and sort of just compromised, right? But that's this idea of city planning where they look at existing traffic structures and then design you know, pedestrian pathways and, and traffic pathways based on usage patterns, right? So looking at otherwise chaotic systems and getting structure from it, and in my mind, um, that is sort of where I see graphs, right? So just like that human brain, it, it looks like it's making these random jumps. And depending on the person, it's more random than others, right? Maybe there's more squirrels and some people stressed out brains at the moment. Um, but there is a pattern, right? There's always some sort of semantic link between those thoughts and kind of linking those together with some sort of structure. It has a lot of power to it. And, and that's where I can see some of the, the power of this graph system or the graph graph approach. Um, so in many ways, the graph database, it's not the only solution that, you know, it has its use cases, but it can be the best of both worlds because it has some structure and, and meaning. Um, and so Tom mentioned that you have this idea of an ontology or sort of that taxonomy is more flexible at taxonomy that you can apply different ontology. So if I want to go to, to Mary's thought about visiting, there's sort of a, um, a relationship ontology that there is a brother, there is a girlfriend, right? There's sort of a place technology that we met this person at a certain place, right? Or we have a common interest. We both like boats, right? Those are all valid sort of ontologies on top of that thought process. They're all valid, but they're all 
different. You didn't have to decide ahead of time, what is Mary going to think about? She's going to think about visiting friends. And this is a, a family pattern, right? Or a friend pattern, relationship pattern. Um, so again, some, it does have a structure, but it also offers some flexibility. Um, so for those of you who do come from the relational world, and I think that's a lot of us on a data diversity webinar, or a lot of us in database world, that's sort of where a lot of us grew up, and, and relational databases are still great. They're not going away. They just have their use case. Um, but as I mentioned before, in a graph, the relationships are really first class constructs. Um, and it's stronger than in other, there's a lot of different ways to model data in today's world, which is what's exciting. Um, but ironically, even though we talk about relational databases, they really lack relationship to first order um, pattern, right? In fact, uh, one of my colleagues and friends, Karen Lopez, who has also spoken a lot at um, Data Diversity, uh, had a quote that I stole and like, so I haven't attributed her. She, she said, you know, the relational database really isn't about relationships, it's about constraints. Right, so you've kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're creating those keys and you're creating those patterns, but it's sort of predefined and it really isn't about those flexible relationships. So that's the one on the right. Um, on the left is sort of a stylized uh, graph pattern where you might have, you know, a customer is an owner of account, um, but, but owner of is a first order construct in the graph model. Whereas if you look at, you know, a customer and account on the right, yes, data modeling tools, and uh, you all know I'm a fan of data modeling. Uh, at a logical data model, you can add those sort of verb phrases, um, but it isn't inherent in your database. There's nowhere in your Oracle that says you know, cu customer is an owner of an account that sort of implied. Uh, so that is one of the powers of graph. Um, and as we showed before, customer is an owner of an account. A customer is also an employee. Um, a, a customer is related to other customers who have similar buying patterns, right? So the more you can kind of add that flexibility, but with semantics and, and metadata meaning, that is sort of the power of graph. So again, this is not a graph 101, how to build a graph, or I mean, there's plenty of uh, the vendors have great videos. There's a lot of good um, resources out there, RDF and OWL and a lot of the good um, re underlying technology of this. There's also some great um, industry patterns that are out there that, you know, a lot of industries are taking up um, a graph and, and there are some industry models or ontologies out there. So plenty of resources, but hopefully if you have not seen graphs before, this again, at least in your brain, can think of, mm, I might have a use case to that. That thing relates to thing, that first order relationships. If you're all about graphs already and you're doing a lot of it, maybe give you a, a new way to think about them um, or a new way to describe to your colleagues graphs, right? We all have that problem of how do you describe what you do for a living to your friends who are not technical or to your client or to your sponsor or your business sponsor in the organization. So hopefully that was a different way of looking at it. But the real reason we want to use graph is for some particular use case. Um, and there's some exciting ones out there. So I thought I would just go through a few to maybe pique your interest or give you some thoughts. If you're not using graph in your organization today, um, we'll go through them. So a very popular one is this idea of social networks, right? Because again, I'm looking at data. I may not know that Donna is related to John. Um, I don't have that first order. So I just want to understand who, who is linked with Donna? Who are those cool people who really are Donna's friends because they like data? And then you'll see up here in the up green, you know, there's a few sad, lonely people who don't like data and are really pathetic. So they are not the cool kids and they are not in Donna's network, right? So that is a facetious example, um, but that is used all the time. Think of, think of when, and I know many of you on this call like me, celebrated when uh, the word metadata was suddenly in the headlines, right? Um, when you think of um, NSA and, and when there was sort of phone metadata and why that was suddenly interesting, right? Um, and because if I just phone call patterns, you can see who is in, in the network calling whom, right? Is there one phone call that's always linked with a certain person? Um, are they, this can be used for, for that type of use case. It can be used for customer patterns what customers may know each other and, and may have sort of social you know, recommendation engine type um, analysis, et cetera. Um, but, but back to metadata being in the headlines, I, I do and I wish I'd saved it and I didn't. I'm always kicking myself. A friend of mine in Melbourne uh, sent me a headline when they were, they were having a similar issue with the metadata of, of cell phones and things. And it said, Prime Minister um, upset at not being invited to metadata talks. I just said, wow, now it is our time in the world where, where that's actually a headline in the newspaper. Um, but because 
people will realize it wasn't necessarily what you talked about on that telephone call, which would be the data. It was the fact of who was making the phone call to whom. And those, that was, again, it's the relationships that were the first order concept on, on struct um, and what makes that rather interesting. So this is used a lot for a lot of different use cases. Um, um, kind of a fun, <laughs> maybe, application of that. Um, if everyone's heard of kind of a, the, the bacon number or the X degrees of separation, um, so that, you know, the fact that anybody with a certain amount of, what do they always say, the three degrees of separation, if you meet somebody, you're always probably even three steps away from somebody else. Uh, and, and people have had fun with that, with Kevin Bacon. Um, folks are not familiar with him. He had some movies, uh, Footloose, I think, was one way back in the day. Um, and there's actually a website on that that you can kind of determine your Bacon number of, of how many degrees of separation is this person from Kevin Bacon. So I picked Audrey Hepburn, just because. Um, and she has both a Bacon number of three and a Bacon number of two. And so that sort of links back to metadata or data quality or master data, right? In the world, there are more than one famous Audrey Hepburn, or is that a data quality issue? And someone put two Audrey Hepburn rec records in that field, right? And that underscores the idea if you don't have good data and you don't have good master data and you don't have good data quality, the power of your graph is um, is weakened, right? And this could either be a really interesting insight, oh, right, there are two Audrey Hepburns, or I think our data is wrong, we need to understand it. So hopefully that was sort of a fun example, but it does give you some examples of um, how this can be used in social graphs, but also how this um, it can have its limitations. I, I will talk about this a little bit later, but I'll touch on it now. I mean, this does have real world implications. We did a project with a, um, talked about this a few times on this call, a, a massive uh, financial institution that was global and their customer base was the high net worth individuals, you know, people like us who have a yacht and several businesses and homes all over the world that need to be insured. Um, and they were trying to understand all those patterns, which are very powerful um, because there's market opportunity, et cetera. But they had the same issue as this Audrey Hepburn issue. They had Joe Smith. And is Joe Smith the multi-billionaire or is Joe Smith um, just some guy who happens to have an account <laughs> and he has $500 in his checking account, right? And so getting that core data was their problem. They had a lot of different powerful analysis they could do, but their own data sets weren't robust enough um, to really get the power of that. Uh, so I mentioned um, financial institutions. They're another group that uses kind of this power of graph and, and fraud detection is one. Um, and this maybe is a helpful use case to kind of discuss, describe that. Um, so again, a lot of graph is about patterns. Um, what are the interconnections that exist? Um, so typically, if, if I'm thinking I have an online transaction, I am buying um, my Christmas presents with my credit card and I go online and I, I purchase something on Amazon, for example. And so uh, you could track that from my user ID, my IP address, my credit card number, and that's fine. Um, and then you might notice that mm, the same IP address is using two. So if you look sort of over to the right, um, they're using um, two, two credit cards. Now, is that problematic? You know, m might that be fraud? Um, maybe, or but that's pretty common. I might have a personal card. I might have the business card. Maybe I'm using my husband's card or, you know, the child using their parent's card. Probably not too strange that there's more than one um, credit card being used for the same IP address. But if you look at this area on the left, might be a little odd that the same IP address has seven different credit cards making purchase from it. So that's that idea of maybe, it doesn't mean this fraud, but it might be something to look into that these sort of, you know, tightly knit graphs where there's all of a sudden a lot of activity on this one IP node might be something to look into. Um, so again, that's sort of an interesting use case for something like a graph that other technologies wouldn't handle as well. Um, another use case for a graph is something like um, a recommendation engine. Um, that we're all familiar with, and this isn't the only way to do this, but it is is one that typical, you know, um, customer bought this, you may also like this, right? So how is that done, right? You can understand the customer's browsing behavior, you can understand their demographics, um, and you can kind of see that link um, that that customer um, um, that that customer one sort of bought a product, and customer two 
also bought the same product, you might say, well, customer two also brought product two. You might like that as well, right? It's kind of transversing that right graph to understand these patterns of the relationships uh, between the different nodes. Again, a kind of an interesting use case. But as I mentioned before, with all of these data quality, um, data volumes, data sets are important to all of this. None of this works well if you don't have good data. I mean, that should be obvious, but it's often forgotten and sometimes in the quest to use new cool tools <laughs> and, and maybe rush to the fast stuff. So yes, knowledge graphs, um, as Tom mentioned, um, can have a lot of power and they can generate a lot of power fairly quickly, but not if you don't have your, your ducks in a row and good data beneath it or, or the right volume of data. So again, maybe a fun example. Um, I'm sure we all sort of get followed by strange ads or <laughs> sometimes we can, I know I try to have a lot of fun with a lot of the folks trying to connect my data and I put really strange search queries in to just try to keep whoever's watching me wondering, right? Um, but I did try to just find some examples of this. Um, and here's one, which was a true use case. Uh, so don't ask, but I did a search on um, an ax there on the left. It's kind of a camping ax where you might want to go split some logs or whatever if you're out on your camping site. And of course it came up, customers who bought this also bought coffee filters. Now that, seems really odd. I mean, and sometimes you might see this too. You're looking at something online, you know, customers who bought these pair of jeans also bought can openers. Well, yeah, I, that, well, I'm not sure why that has it. You know, sometimes it does make sense, right? Someone who bought this coffee pot also bought these coffee filters to go with it. Um, but again, if they did, there wasn't a good data set beneath this or, or the data set is small. So this may very well be someone was going camping. Um, and they bought an axe to sort of buy, cut, uh, cut some, some wood for their, their campfire. Um, and that type of disc filter actually is a common one used for some of those camping pots or the coffee pots that are used that you can put over a fire um, and are often used in camping. So that might be, so that might be a really interesting insight for somebody um, that campers tend to buy these two products. Or it might just be really weird, right? Because there's not enough data to really say, um, you know, it would probably make more sense. People who bought this ax bought this ax sharpening tool or something like that. So again, um, you need to have good data sets. You need to have the right uh, volume and variety of the data to really make some of these results make sense. Um, you know, doing a graph on a spreadsheet of four people, you know, probably isn't valuable. We probably need that, and that's an extreme example. But um, it is a good thing to think about that you want to have the right data sets to make that make sense. Um, and as with many of my webinars, I, I sometimes feel like a, a little grumpy person. Um, but sometimes it's helpful to describe something, what it is by what it is not. Um, and I get frustrated. Um, it was not the sponsor today, um, but often the, the vendors sort of over um, over promise with it. They have a really good technology and therefore everything can be solved by that technology. Um, and I think that does a disservice to the really cool technologies that are offered, right? Just be proud on what you offer because it's cool enough. And Graph is one of those. It is cool enough. It just isn't everything. And, and one I am sort of passionate about is master data management. And I would say in terms of um, some of the use cases in our practice at Global Data Strategy, things like governance and master data are the biggest growing, other than strategy, because we do a lot of that, um, are the biggest growing ones. And, and ironically, often it's because of things like graph and data science and a lot of the kind of newer technologies, because people really have to get their data right. Um, but I have found that a lot of the, it's what you sort of define by master data management, I define, and I think um, the DM box sort of defines the master data is that, sort of that common single version of the truth of your data. Who is John Smith? Who is Audrey Hepburn? Um, who is Donna Burbank? You know, what, what is that right version of the customer? And do you have their most recent and accurate attributes? Often that is done in a centralized way, commonly relational. I mean, I think that relational is a really great use case for MDM because it is all about those constraints and relationships and quality and rules. Um, that is what relational is very good at and has historically been at. Um, and there's also this idea of more of a, a virtualized or a registry that often is more of that sort of data fabric or, or kind of graph approach. Um, both can work. I tend to be a fan of the left because, and I'm, I'm not at all um, discounting the, the, the value of the kind of um, data fabric, but I think that has a different use case that I'll get into. I think if you're really trying to get that single view of person, 
kind of some of that, you know, getting those rules in place. You can do the virtualization layer. I think you have to just have your act together even more so than the one on the left, right? You have to have a really good data model. You have to have a really great understanding of the different source cases, source systems that are being virtualized um, and connected through that layer. Um, and and the, one of the reasons I am not a fan of it is because when I see it in usage, Sometimes it's sort of like plastering over the holes in the wall, right? People want to get to the answer fast um, and call that master data. It's not, right? Master data is the hard work to get that single view correct. As long as you're doing that, the virtualization, that's fine. I just think um, in some, that, that virtualization can be better used in other, other ways. The hard stuff around master data is the data governance, the parsing, the matching, the data quality, the semantic meaning of, of what you mean uh, by a customer. Um, and one of the benefits of graph is that semantic meaning can be fluid, right? A John Smith can be a customer. It could also be X, Y, Z. But at some point with master data, you want to put that line in the ground and, ground and say, yes, but his name is X and his address is Y. Um, and that, that's sort of what I um, just wanted to stress with that particular use case. Um, and again, <laughs> my little um, rant is, is, you know, often when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And we're all, we all do it. Wow, I've discovered graph. I'm going to use graph for everything. Um, and you don't want to overdo because that just doesn't do service to the uh, technologies. Um, and I also have seen very flexible use of the word data warehousing. And we know as data people, semantics are important. I think a very common historical use of the word, word data warehouse um, is this idea of aggregating, summarizing data in a relational or dimensional model, which isn't a graph use case. And I actually was impressed with Thomas' presentation that they were very clear. It's a graph mark, right? Very similar, very powerful, but let's just be really clear when we're using things. If you're talking about your more traditional data mark, that is a thing and that has a name. So, so don't use existing names for a new thing. You know, be, be creative with something like a graph mark that's much more descriptive um, and it does stuff justice to both. And they both absolutely have their place and are powerful. Um, so data warehouse, where you might use relational or dimensional. I mean, if you're doing something like total, show me total sales by region and customer each month, and I want to slice and dice, I want to make sure I understand what total sales mean, what region is, and I have very structured reports. I'm doing my annual report to the board. Data warehouse, like that, that just screams data warehouse to me. That use case doesn't go away. In fact, I would say maybe the third common a popular thing that we're getting other than well, only fourth data strategy, data governance, and uh, and master data is data warehousing. It's as popular as ever. Plenty of people need data warehouses for the use cases they are good at. I've, I've heard sort of disparaging comments of, oh, that's old school. We don't need them anymore. It's the classic yes and. We do need them. Um, if I, I would think I want my financial reports done consistently and correctly, and I want to be able to slice and dice by region. So whenever I hear those types of words, I like look for warehouse, but, and <laughs> we want to use that. There's also this sort of newer way of looking at things that, that Tom mentioned as well, this enterprise knowledge graph, where that has a different use case. It's the similarities, and, and this is where perhaps a non-technical person could get confused. They're both enterprise-wide. They're both looking at data across the organization, but with a very different lens and a very different way of looking at things. You might want to say, okay, let's look across all of the organization and who are my most influential customers. Yeah, you could get that from the warehouse. I could, I could kind of see who's spending the most with us each month or by year and that kind of thing. But maybe I want to look at it with a different lens. Who has the most connections, right? I, I might have, um, and I think if you were on my data, master data management webinar, I think it was two months ago, um, I kind of talked about that where we had the two Stefan Krauses, I think it was, um, both bought Ski, ski products. Um, one um, was a banker in Zurich, and he spent the most, right? He spent you know, thousands of euros every year. And then there was another Stefan Krauss who was a ski instructor, and he only spent about 500 euros because he got everything free. And, and at that point with Master Data, we said, well, maybe he isn't your best customer, best meaning spent the most money. But were you to throw a knowledge graph on that same use case? He might absolutely be your best customer because he's connected with all the skiers in Switzerland and he talks to all of them and he's winning all the races and he's very high profile, right? So I think the combination of those two use cases where I have Stefan Cross the banker, that if I look at him in a data warehouse um, viewpoint, he's great. Both are great, right? But for a different way because he spends the most, most of us every year 
and he always spends in December because that's when he goes on holiday and buys brand new skis every year and uses them five times. Um, Stefan Krauss, who's been using the site and gets all his skis free, doesn't matter uh, on the how much he spent, but he's actually influenced another 10 people um, to spend, and maybe he's also very important. So again, just different tools, both very helpful and very valuable. Um, again, another way to look at graph, and excuse me, hopefully they're helpful and not completely strange, um, the, the connection between ballroom dancing and data management, I'm sure that's the first thing you thought of when you were, thought you were attending a graph database webinar. Um, but um, I have tried my hand at ballroom dancing and I'm terrible. Um, but this sort of helped me understand this analogy is that when you first try any sort of dancing, all you're trying to do is, is understand um, what direction you're going in. And, and, and they're saying these words, and do I even know what these steps mean? And you are completely self-absorbed, and you probably don't see anybody else in the whole room, and you're just wondering, do I look strange? Am I going in the same direction as everybody else? And what am I doing here, right? And then you get a little better, and you know what the dance steps mean, and you actually look up and you say, wow, I, I have a partner here. <laughs> Maybe I should pay attention to what they're doing. And then you start getting equally self-conscious and say, but I better not step on their feet. And, and but, you, but you're at that level, you've gotten yourself under control, and you're now sort of kind of reacting and dancing with your partner when that goes. Um, well, it's a really cool feeling. Um, I, have, I guess I've gotten good enough in dancing that I can kind of experience what this phrase is saying. And you're really in, in, in tune with your partner and you're spinning. And then when you're a really good dancer, you're dancing with the room um, because you realize that everybody has their patterns um, and, and you're sort of dancing with the other couples and there's a, you realize there's a whole sort of nuance with that zeitgeist or whatever of the room. Um, and I sort of see that, okay, there is a connection here uh, with data management, right? Dancing with yourself. If you don't know who John Smith is or the data quality is terrible or you don't have his purchase data linked with him and you don't have his address, you're not going to get very far with graph because you don't have great data, right? And the more then you can link with your partner or start to make those connections, um, e either with a warehouse or in any sort of connection, that's fine. But when you can really make all of those connections across your enterprise thing, that's sort of the dancing with the room. And to me, that's the knowledge graph. And the power of knowledge graph is that you can look holistically across different disparate data sets without um, a particular lens in mind. Maybe you don't know the answers yet, um, and you can kind of see some of those patterns. And that's, I think, the beauty of graph um, with the right use case, right? So hopefully that was helpful and not too off the wall as I am known to get. <laughs> um, so again, that's my connection here with this idea of a knowledge graph that is that dancing with the room. That yes, I now know that the, the Audrey Hepburn we're looking at is the one that was born May 1st, 1929. Uh, she's not a customer, current customer because she's dead. Sorry to be blunt. Um, but, and I didn't know this, but I did some research. She has a son, uh, Luca Docci, and he's born in 1970. He's a customer. That might be interesting because he owns the fancy yacht she purchased. And now, do we ever know that this person named Luca Docci is very wealthy and owns all the mansions that Audrey Hepburn had? I assume. I don't know. This is a fake example. Those people are real. Right. But that just shows you an example of you understand the data. I know which Audrey Hepburn I'm talking about. Maybe from my structured data, I know that there's a family relationship between her and her son. Um, and then from that, you can get some of that graph. A little bit of a hand wave. I mean, there's a lot of pieces of that. Um, but it uh, shows the example of that you may not have been able to get as rich of a interconnections um, that you can by kind of connecting some of those data sets with graph. Um, but as many things in technology and life, it's a yes and, it's not an either or. Uh, so graph can augment a lot of different technologies, can often power, often a lot of power. It doesn't give you a, an out to not have good data. <laughs> Nothing. I haven't found one technology that helps you not have good data. Because um, if you don't know Audrey Hepburn, you know, that is data. That the actual human being is data, the actual customer. Um, so before we sort of close up, and I know there's been a lot of sort of questions popping up, and um, I'm sure uh, Tom has some good insights too. You can pick his brain. Um, I think another benefit of these diversity webinars, we can maybe give you some insights and some data on data on data. Um, so we did a survey. I, I with the diversity uh, folks did a, a survey this year. We do it each year on trends in data management or trends in data architecture, depending on the year. Um, and if you look. Compared to the kind of the, the traditional workhorses like 
uh, relational databases, don't get me started. Also, spreadsheets, that's a whole other webinar. Let's all agree that that's probably not a great idea for enterprise data management. Um, but you'll see the graph database in terms of current adoption is fairly low. Um, again, the, the audience for this is your sort of traditional data diversity attendee. So that's kind of us, right? So I'm, I'm wondering or if anyone in the comments wants to share who is using graph. Um, not the highest adoption. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think there is interest. And it doesn't fit every use case, whereas, you know, I think every organization has some sort of relational need for your operational systems in your warehouses and things like that. Not every has the need for a, uh, a graph, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that's a, a bad trend, although I would like to see that increasing because I do think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I do find, though, interesting, we asked this question in two different ways. Who is planning on using this data in the next one to two years? And then you will see... Uh, that there is a spike going up. So we, we, in this last survey, did two years. So 2019 actually saw a higher spike than 2020. Um, but still, it's, a, it's about 20% are, are looking to grow. And that, that's in addition to people who are already using it. So obviously, probably 30% or higher are probably in the kind of graph realm in the next couple of years. Um, just as an overall, I think we're all, <laughs> many of us are ready to have 20 20 in the, in the rear view mirror. Um, we saw in general, if you kind of look at a lot of those, a lot of people are doing a lot less experimentation in, I wouldn't say graph is really experiment, but non-traditional approaches than normal. Um, and if you read that report, I'm not trying to plug it, but it is free on data diversity. If you, I'm so sure I will send out that link. Um, you'll see that in general, people were sort of going back to comfort. I, I think in, in a recession in the world, is a sort of, um, up, up in arms, um, a lot of folks were kind of going back to uh, relational or cloud-based databases, some of them maybe more stable. That said, I know I work with a lot of customers who are actually going the other direction and upping their investment in things like digital transformation because everybody's digital. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't personally uh, not look at some of these new technologies because of current events. I would sort of go the opposite and say start looking at some of these new technologies because I notice in my customer base, um, the more people who had their data in a row and had some great data strategies and plans really didn't skip too much of a beat with this new world. Um, I, I, I coined a phrase with my dad this morning, the, the, the nouveau work from home. I, you know, I think a lot of us have been digital for years, and I'm sort of upset that other people figured out about working in their pajamas. Um, but I, I do think there are a lot more nouveau work from home, and now there's a lot more rich data that can be used to really support those people. So anyway, hopefully that data, that information is, is helpful to people. Um, so uh, just to kind of summarize, uh, for those of you who are new to Graph or are interested in Graph, just think of it, again, in the myriad technologies you need to keep in your poor data management brain. Uh, think of Graph, and I hope I'm not oversimplifying for Tom. It's a thing relates to thing um, where you can really use that power of the relationships to have great discoveries of your data. There is a lot of really interesting use cases. I only just started with a handful, um, but this has been in use with things like social networks and, and whenever you have the, the whole idea of the enterprise knowledge graph of how can we look at our data holistically across the organization with without the lens of I have pre-described rules that I only know the answers to I have a loose set of rules that can be flexible with an ontology and get a lot of different answers from the data, um, which can be a really helpful use case. So uh, before we open it up for questions, just a blatant plug for my organization. If you need help with Graph or anything else that we discuss, we'd be happy to help you. Um, and then a bigger plug for next year's lineup, uh, a popular one that we always do in January is a little bit of a sneak peek to what we do with Graph. You know, what are the emerging trends and what is that next big thing? Maybe it's Graph, maybe it's something else. We will, we will learn that in January. Um, but that's always a fun one uh, to kind of think with this new lens for the new year, what are some of the technologies to look at? So without further ado, because I know there's a lot of questions, I'm going to pass it over to Shannon to kind of open up for Q&A. Shannon? Shannon, thank you so much. As always, appreciate it. Oh, I got a little bit of echo there. Uh, just so if you have questions for Donna, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And just answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording as long with, along with anything else requested throughout here. 
So diving in, uh, so, and Thomas, we invite you to join in as you um, feel like in the Q and A here. Is, uh, is JSON a standard format for graph database? Is it not, uh, if not, is there any? Um, I'll give a quick answer and then I'll pass it over to Tom, who I'm sure has input as well. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, I would think things like RDF and OWL are kind of too um, sparkle. I mean, there's really a whole new set of, of way. When you think, I would just sort of, if you're looking at it, Google things like ontologies um, and um, th there's some great, but R RDF is a sort of a common one um, that people look at. But Tom, did you want to give some thoughts yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> This is an echo. Um, RDF is, is a data model that our, our database uses. Um, there's also other data models. That, JSON can be a serialization format, basically how the data gets exported. And there's a, there's a, um, there's a type of JSON called JSON-LD, uh, which is a linked data format. And so that is a, a common serialization format where you can basically move data around from tool to tool in a JSON-like format. Um, so, so yes, uh, it, internally, uh, our database uses the RDF data model, which is basically just a data model construct. Um, internally, we have our own representation, like in, in the code, et cetera. But, um, you know, other databases support labeled property graphs and, and, and that type of thing. And then there's many different serialization formats. Like you can serialize the data into turtle files, which is an RDF format or n triple, which is another uh, RDF format where you can, uh, you know, export it is, uh, you know, there's many different file types. Uh, XML is another one that it can be uh, serialized as. Perfect. So for MDM, would you use data modeling repository content and place that in a graph database? Um, yeah, yeah, yes. I, well, I would, I would, well, I, I think MDM, that's probably a whole other webinar, but yeah, MDM would be a source that could either be distributed to the operational systems or the reporting systems. Uh, but yes, then they, they would be the source and there could be many sources. So I don't think it's limited to MDM. I, I think often MDM is the one that would feed sort of those, if you think back to Tom's example, there was sort of the, you know, the, um, Oh, okay, I don't think about the, the drug you know, FDA. Um, you know, they, they have their repositories of data that, that MDM can augment. Um, but, but yes, you're going to have different data sources that the graph can sort of sit upon. And I see MDM or data quality as sort of a foundation that feeds those systems that then feeds the graph, if that makes sense. But, you know, Tom, feel free to chime in with your thoughts as well. Yeah. Um, um, we would ingest the data models from each one of the sources and then inside of our ANZO knowledge graph platform, you could build your model however you wanted to represent the data. Uh, so you would use that as a tool versus a, a different type of uh, data modeling tool. Uh, so if you create, if you think about it in traditional MDM world, you have a golden record. And you could create a golden record that says, I want customer information that comes from database one, two, and three, and build out this, this customer record, right? You can build that in a tool, but it will look much different in a graph. And so we give you the tools to build that in the graph, and we can automatically ingest those data models from those databases one, two, and three, and, and then let you link those together and pick out the different features that you need uh, for your use case. All right, and uh, Donna, going back to slide 20, um, back to, and still on the topic of MDM, uh, is data actually stored in the virtualization layer or are they more like views? Yeah, no, good, good question. Um, so I guess the, the main difference, um, without doing a whole webinar on this, which we, we did a few whiles back. Um, so yeah, the difference of those is the one on the left in the centralized model, you're physically moving um, data uh, from into that MDM hub. So um, where Tom mentioned that golden record, why that central thing is gold, um, that uh, you really take those attributes from, you know, or copies of that attributes into that MDM hub, and then that can go bi-directionally. So you're moving the data into those systems. With the virtualization layer, uh, the data more stays in place and then you're, you're doing that sort of um, query layer on top of it. So that would be sort of the foundational difference between those two. Are you moving data into one place 
or, or, and then querying it from that, or are you leaving data in its place? And then through that query, you know, you saying, I want to take attribute A from system A and attribute B from system B. And that is sort of the main difference between those two. But again, as always, Tom, if you want to chime in on that as well. You're muted, Tom, if you are speaking. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, the only thing I would add is that we can support both um, virtualized and uh, in, in memory, or in, you, know, you can ingest the data in part of the graph and have part of it virtualized. So we support kind of a combination of both of those. So some sources are very, some operational systems, the data is very active, right? It's getting updated regularly. And um, you may want to, when you query to find the golden record, or to pull out the, the information you need, you want to query that source in real time. And so you won't want to virtualize that source where other data sources are, are, are simply copied or repressed on some periodic basis. And, Donna, going back a little bit again, you know, what did you mean by a time series database? Um, so time series database, whether it's a database itself or a way of using a database, um, so often, I mean, often that can be com common with things like IoT, right, where you want to get sort of data sets in a time. So every minute I'm getting a read from this particular data source um, and kind of understanding the time patterns across it. Um, I've also seen it used, um, uh, we were working with an education department and it was sort of that time dimension they were interested with, um, with say a student in, in their time across from being a freshman senior uh, to a you know postgraduate and kind of just laying out that data in more of a time series so that it's the time dimension is, is sort of flattening it out that way, um, if that makes sense. But maybe the easier way to think about it is more something like an IoT where I have a machine that's it's you know every minute is sort of sending out data and then you're kind of looking at the time patterns across it. Was there a spike in internet use at this particular you know time from not between seven and eight in the morning? Um, is when we're seeing the spike, and it's kind of the, the, the way it's you know, serialized is by that time slice. I mean, the, the database could be anything, right? But it's, um, you know, it could be a spreadsheet you're putting in it, which probably isn't the most ideal. But that, that's the idea of that time <laughs> I like it. I think we have time for at least one more question here. Um, how scalable are graph databases? Can graph databases work with millions of records? Uh, unable to digest that graph databases can be truly scalable to work with. I think that I definitely will let Tom chime in because I know he has an opinion. I'm sure he has an opinion. Um, but I think yes. And I think that is sort of the a lot of the organizations that are using graph are some very large scale organizations and that's the power of graph is that yes if i have a spreadsheet of 10 people uh, i can probably eyeball it and see who's related to whom right but when it's, you do have a massive uh, scale and you can't um, use traditional patterns and i think that is where some of the the value is so i would think definitely that is that is i think also the rise in popularity um is really looking across these large scale data sets but i'll pass it back to you tom too to give your two cents yeah thanks <laughs> Here at Cambridge Semantics, uh, enterprise scale is really critical, and uh, our database is an in-memory distributed MPP graph database, and, and we've tested it up to, up to 200 node cluster and over a trillion facts. And so this was a really huge um, cluster of systems operating as a single database, um, and, and so we published those benchmark results. Um, I think that one of the uh, reasons graph has not seen uh, adoption uh, as, as quickly as, as we would like or in the past is because many of the graph databases have not been able to scale. So all of the, you know, the graph databases up until recently uh, were not distributed, were not MPT, et cetera. Now we're able to scale you know, vertically and horizontally um, to handle any data volume. That's really critical for our business because we're ingesting uh, data from all over an organization and sometimes keeping all of that in memory uh, for high performance. So, you know, sub-second theory response times across uh, trillions of, of, of data elements. Yeah, and just to add that I was looking at the, the chat while Tom was talking and some uh, people chimed in that, I mean, it's true that some, some of the first 
types of companies that use this graph were some of the big ones. You know, think of Google and <laughs> Amazon as some of the, the big players. I think the exciting part now is that a lot of the similar technologies, if not the technologies themselves, are now available to sort of regular people. <laughs> um, and so that democratization of graph is, I think, is something really powerful people want to consider. Well, thank you both so much for this great presentation, and thanks to Cambridge Semantics for sponsoring today and helping to make these webinars happen. Really appreciate it. Uh, just We are to the top of the hour here, so just want to send a reminder to everybody that uh, you will get the follow-up email by end of day of Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording from today's presentations. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Thanks for being so engaged in everything we do. Uh, Donna and Thomas, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Always Thank a pleasure. You. Thank you. Enjoy it. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe out there and have a great day. Bye-bye.